Oh, hey, we just went online, but uh, Kathy and I this morning um, are going to greet you officially as soon as the house church contingent, contingent at Dave Woods and Lisa's home signs in. Uh, so we're waiting on them. So, uh, Kathy, how's your daily Bible reading go? It's going well. <laughs> All right. I'm on track by the grace of God. It couldn't be much easier to have it read to you <laughs> or to be able to read it, to have it all sorted out. I mean, really, it's such one, a blessing. One stood out to me this week when we were reading together was uh, 1 Samuel 28, 6, where Saul is, is, is in desperation. He hasn't decided what to do, but he's... He's just moaning that uh, that he can't hear from God as to whether to send his armies into battle or not. And the scripture says in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 28 that God stopped speaking to him even by the Urim or the lots. And you think about that, like, you know, the lots were, you know, binary, yes or no, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And God wouldn't speak to him. So how did that happen? I mean, did he just like... <laughs> uh, it makes Confusion. you... Confusion. Yeah, I okay. Think that's, <laughs> I think that's what still happens in our lives. Yeah, yeah, I can't decide. We get confused. We, we, we hear from the Lord at certain times. <clears> we <throat> think we understand what the Word is saying. And then other times we're just confused. Yeah, yeah. But... The Holy Spirit helps us. Yeah. Um, I'm really grateful <clears throat> we're not living in Old Testament times and that we have forgiveness for sins and a way to be right. Yeah. With the Lord despite. That's pretty sins. sad when God won't even speak to you through the roll of the dice, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Just your way out there. And it's right after that that Saul went to the medium to uh, try and conjure up his old friend Samuel to help him, you know. Well, and plus <clears throat> the role of the dice, I mean, that was something, I mean, not dice, but that was something for them. Whereas now, if we're trusting in that, if we're trusting in in just some kind of magic, um, I don't think we're going to find the Lord like that. All right. Okay, we've got the signal. So we want to welcome you to Zoe Church this morning. Uh, we are at home in a pseudo-modern world. And welcome to all of you at Dave and Lisa's home and, and the rest of you joining online. <clears throat> I just want to really thank those of you this week who who contacted me to let me know that you're watching online. Mm -hmm. I'm really encouraged by that, as well as our uh, attentive audience at our, at our home church at Dave and Lisa's. Uh, it's just uh, such a, a great time to be teaching the Word. And and uh, I'm excited about this morning because we've got more of the Word to teach and more things to go through. And and uh, you'll, um, you'll know that we are still in existence and <clears throat> you can contribute to the cause uh, to keep the teaching of the Word going out through uh, zoechurch.com. If you do Zell, you can... Uh, you can do uh, zell at zoechurch.com. It'll come right into, uh, into our account. Uh, if you want to subscribe to the newsletter that Dave puts out every week, which keeps you in touch with everything that's happening, <clears throat> uh, it also has a link to PayPal in it, so you can see that and go there. Contact uh, me or Dave this week, and we can get you on that list. And other than that, we have uh, these stream events on Facebook, and, uh, and, and they're still free. And when they start charging, we'll move completely over to YouTube. <laughs> but uh, we have um, a more stable version on YouTube uh, beginning on Monday, so you can look back and get the right sound and the right uh, tempo going for the, for the entire service. And uh, <clears throat> other than that, <clears throat> excuse me. Or you can do both, which I know you do, and I'm impressed by that. But uh, so um, anyway, that's uh, that's where we're at this morning, and uh, I just uh, want to thank you all for being there, and thank you, Kathy, for being here this morning. And I want to turn it over to you for a prayer this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, let's go before the Lord and, and start our service that way. 
Oh, Lord, I thank you so much for all the ways that you work. Your ways are not our ways. They're far beyond our ways. And they're so good, Lord. And you've given us so much in this life, so many different ways to be able to reach you and, and um, hear from you um, through your word. And, and I thank you for this morning, even though John and I can't be in person with people this morning, that we are in person with you all together and that your whole church, your whole little flock in this whole world that is meeting in the name of Jesus this morning is in contact with you and we are together that way and I praise you, Lord, for that. I'm encouraged by who you are, Lord. If we look so long at ourselves, we'll just be so discouraged because we can never um, meet all the things we would need to meet but in you in you Jesus we are enough because of you and I thank you for your beautiful words in Jeremiah 17 and just remembering the blessing of um, of knowing you and trusting you the blessing of not being tumbleweeds in the desert because we don't trust you and haven't put our hope in you but the choice we have today of trusting you, having our hope and confidence in you, having uh, being planted by the rivers of water and having deep roots and bearing fruit always, no matter how smooth or wrinkly our skin is, that we can have such good roots in you. And I just want to worship you today and give you all the things in all of our lives. I pray that you would be with each one of us and help us with our difficulties. But Lord, let us see your goodness and know that there is so much to praise you for and be thankful for. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Kathy. Okay, let's, uh, let me readjust here, if you would. Give me a second and center up and all that stuff. And uh, Okay, we have a scripture this morning from 1 Timothy. If you would turn in your Bible there with me. <clears throat> Excuse me. A little bit of a sticky throat this morning, so I'll be indulging in water as we go along. 1 Timothy chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 3 through 7. <clears throat> Paul the Apostle writing, to Timothy, when I left for Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussion of myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations which don't help people live a life of faith in God. <clears throat> Excuse me. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, clear conscience, and genuine faith. But some people have missed this whole point. They have turned away from these things and spent their time in meaningless discussions. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they are talking about, even though they speak so confidently. One more prayer, prayer please. So, Father, uh, take this important passage of Scripture and help us understand it. I pray that you would reveal to our mind's eye and our heart uh, the meaning and intent of this. I pray that along the way we could learn uh, the, the Apostle Paul's plight, the plight of the early Christians, and the things that make the context that's not just background, but total involvement by a new budding home church movement in the first century and an empire that's collapsing from within and without and the interactions between them that led to first timothy titus and second timothy pray we could get a firmer handle on the vagueness that we have in our mind behind this so that we can understand the intent the desperation and the solution proposed by paul through it and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we start this morning with a, um, I don't know, a nod. Nod doesn't seem like the right word, but we observe the passing of Tim Keller, who, uh, who has meant so much to so many uh, in the last couple decades. 
I have a couple of Tim Keller quotes that are my favorite. Uh, he, runs, he wrote, describe the God you've rejected, describe the God you don't believe in, and maybe I don't believe in that God either. Uh, just a, 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 a fantastic perspective. And, and then another one, contemporary people tend to examine the Bible looking for things they can't accept. But Christians should reverse that, allowing the Bible to examine us, looking for things that God can't accept. Those are some awesome quotes by an awesome uh, man of God, gifted, sent to us, but a humble man. And uh, he takes his place in the line of, of tremendous uh, helps to us all. And I'm reminded of John Stott. And, and uh, in our century, there have been teachers who have just able to connect with contemporary society and yet serve the body of Christ in a way that helps us live a real life uh, in the world around us. Now, I didn't do too much reading of Tim Keller uh, in the last decade or two. Uh, and the reason why is the same reason I, don't, I skip a lot of other popular works is because I can't keep from uh, set, uh, merging that into my own teaching. I noticed uh, early or late in my uh, internship that, uh, that I could read someone like an Oz Guinness and really agree with them. And then, and then before you know it, I was teaching Oz Guinness, not knowingly in my sermons. And so I kind of avoided that stuff, although uh, I just thoroughly enjoyed um, uh, Keller's forgive, excuse me, forgive me. I just rolled over the audio cord. So if you heard a real blip, it was me doing that. And uh, hopefully I've straightened that out now. So uh, his recent work, Forgive, uh, I loved it. I recommend it. Uh, but one thing that Tim Keller did that impacted me and, uh, and many others uh, was in 2005, our first, during our first full year of Zoe, uh, he started, along with Don Carson, uh, the Gospel Coalition. And the Gospel Coalition uh, was an amazing organization. It's still around today. Uh, it was an amazing organization founded during a time when, uh, the, when many false teachings were entering into the church and, and some of them uh, were unclear whether they were uh, false or, or whatever. And, and you know that at the time, Don Carson was the foremost writer on what to make of the emergent movement. And so he had written with a track record of being able to parse scriptures accurately and steer in a good way. And yet uh, uh, Keller also was that, he had that pastoral, not just the theological doctrinal bent, he had that understanding pastorally. And uh, so, so they formed this organization, which Carson said was not a monolith. In other words, it wasn't one organization. It was a, a coalition of pastors, mostly 40 of them, who were all committed to the gospel of Jesus and who could together provide guidance and accountability for pastors everywhere by holding their feet into the fire of whether they were teaching the scriptures properly and properly uh, leading people to the true gospel of Christ. A great organization in theory, and I watched it closely. And the only hesitation I had with joining it wholeheartedly was the fact that uh, Mark Driscoll and C.J. Mahaney and a bunch of others were on that original Gospel Coalition uh, uh, board. And uh, I just couldn't quite uh, dive into that uh, with, with both hands. <laughs> or dive into the deep water of that, or get my arms around it, whatever metaphor applies here. Uh, as, it, as it turns out, the Gospel Coalition probably had a very good, a positive effect on holding these men accountable uh, through the years, Joshua Harris and, and, uh, and others who, who drifted away, who had their own churches shut them down. Uh, the Gospel Coalition could then go to them and say, you, you need to get this right, you need to get this in order. And so it effectively um, addressed issues in that way. Uh, I don't think today it is, it is um, 
up to the task of meeting the needs. I think the needs of the community of faith have accelerated uh, in an uber way, if I can say that. And I'll say more about that as we go by. But for its time, the Gospel Coalition was the kind of answer to the problems in the mid-aughts, which uh, it, it's in vain or in line with the answer that the Apostle Paul presents in 1 Timothy for the problems of the late 60s in the first century. So with that said, uh, let's, let's dive into our part two of this text. Now, you might notice that I extended to verse seven, uh, this, this opening section. I, did, I left verse six and seven out intentionally last week to not confuse you. I wanted to make, I wanted to highlight verse five um, for you so that we could focus on it and deal with the content. And that will pay off today as we, um, as we look at the entire first section, verses three through seven. So um, I want to uh, start today by, um, by giving you a little uh, background. Uh, we made the contention last, uh, last week that verse five was, was central. Uh, it is the answer to the contextual problem, which we're going to look at today. Uh, uh, Christianity uh, and the faith of Christianity was under, um, I don't want to say attack, because that's just the contemporary buzzword. It really was being, uh, uh, being tried to limit being, <laughs> my words are going to come together, take my word for that. So Christianity was, was um, threatened by Nero to be eliminated from the face of the earth, literally. Uh, and, and so it faced that contextual problem. So that, the problem stated is that Nero wants to eliminate Christianity. Now, how did this problem uh, emerge? And, and what is Paul writing about this problem? And how is he dealing with this problem? Well, um, he's, he's dealing with this problem in an amazing way. He's not saying, uh, go uh, have a siege mentality, hide from the empire, flee, run, which later would have been a legitimate strategy. Uh, fleeing persecution, the 10 great persecutions was a legitimate uh, Christian response to those persecutions. But when Paul came back, from Spain in the midst of, an, of this emergency, Paul went immediately to the churches which he had formed, not to Rome, where all, of, all hell was breaking loose and the killing of Christians. Uh, he, he didn't go to Rome. He went back to uh, his area uh, in Asia Minor, uh, Ephesus. And, and, and we don't know if he went exactly to Ephesus or if he met Timothy in Miletus or another place near Ephesus, but he heard what was happening in his church. When I say his, I mean the church that Paul was, was uh, overseeing by his apostolic authority. And to his surprise, Timothy's report, and later he would see this firsthand on the island of Crete, where, where, he, would write, or where he would write Titus the letter to, uh, Timothy gave him a surprise. That is, the church is not doing well, it is wandering. Uh, what you left a few years ago, Paul, when you went to Spain, uh, it hasn't grown spiritually. It is diversifying. It is, I think it may be growing, Timothy might have said, or this may be for the better. New ideas are coming in, fresh ways of, of, of bringing people in uh, are happening. And, uh, and, and Paul could hear it and he could realize, uh-oh, we've got to shore up the walls of, of the movement or else there will not be a faith that survives that's genuine. It will be a faith that's no longer uh, genuine. So that's the occasion for the writing, that, that Christianity has gotten off track. And the way Paul knows it is because of what's happening in the home churches that he himself was deeply involved with or started and he and Timothy had overseen at first. And so, um, and so that brings us back to determining uh, the approximate date of this epistle. Now, 
uh, we did a lot of groundwork on this last time. Uh, the earliest Christian extant writing besides the New Testament, 1 Clement, uh, claims that Paul uh, uh, preached in the East and in the West. He won renown for his faith. He taught righteousness to the whole world and to the pillars of Hercules. And, and so that can only mean that Paul, in 96 AD, so 30 years later, they believed he went all the way to Spain with the gospel. So uh, uh, couple that with the fact that um, in, uh, in the Moratorian Canon, which, which describes books of the Bible that are authentic in the, near the end of the second century, that, uh, that um, also the mention of Paul going to Spain is there and describing Luke's writings and claims that Luke didn't mention them because he didn't go with Paul. He went back to Macedonia. And so he only wrote about what he could verify and testify to firsthand. But, uh, but the Moratorian Canon says that Paul proceeded to Spain. So I, my contention is that if you're going to make up some story about Paul didn't go to Spain, where are you basing that on? Because no one uh, in the ancient church believed that Paul didn't go to Spain. Okay, so plain and simple, it appears uh, he went to Spain. And we're going to proceed under that particular assumption, which means some very dynamic things historically. Uh, first of all, that th it means that Paul was released by the empire and I'm going to use that word for, for, Roman, for the Roman Empire because it was the empire. Uh, he was released by the empire and that he was then again years later imprisoned, which led to his execution. So there was a gap of years in there. And so what we want to do is fix that date. So it appears from Luke's writing in Acts that about 62 AD, early in the year, that Paul was released from the Roman prison, not by a judicial decision, but because after two years time, there wasn't a group of Jews who came to Rome and pressed the case against him. The only case against him came from the Jews. And so under Roman law, the imprisonment of Paul ended and he was released. It's important you understand he wasn't cleared because this would provide the premise later as a Roman citizen for him to be executed and uh, executed rather abruptly. So, uh, so 62 AD, he's uh, released from prison and he goes to Spain. And then somewhere after the start of the, Ro of the empire's annihilation of Christians, Paul gets word of it in Spain and heads back immediately to see the crisis. This is probably late 65 AD or early 66. Okay, uh, the fire in Rome, which we'll talk about in a minute, was in 64 AD. Nero blamed it on Christians and then in the end of 64 AD, uh, Christians were, were killed uh, in the city of Rome uh, just arbitrarily. And by the way, not in the Colosseum. Uh, that all happened in Circus Maximus, uh, which is uh, the center of where uh, Nero wanted to rebuild. But that's where all the atrocities were primarily committed. And those atrocities included uh, Christians being used as human torches and other such uh, horrible things eaten by wild animals in, in, uh, in Circus Maximus. Okay. So in the, now in the interim, uh, 65 AD, Paul arrives back at, uh, at, Mas at, uh, at uh, Miletus, perhaps, or Ephesus, goes there and checks up on the church. Now, I find that really significant that that was his first, uh, first thing to check up on. And his concern for how the ministry was progressing was everything to him. He wasn't scrambling to try and stop the madness in Rome. He wasn't scrambling to try and, uh, you know, try and do other things that, that uh, we would have thought of uh, if we were involved in such a, uh, in, in such a mess. Uh, but rather, 
Uh, he was going to establish the firmness of the, of the churches that were meeting in houses. And, and that firmness to Paul was everything. And verse 5 is why. Because the, the goal of all the instruction that goes on in the home church should aid in love. Now, there's something we didn't touch in verse 5 that, that uh, causes confusion. But verse 5 literally says the goal of our instruction is love, agape. It doesn't say being filled with love. Okay, Agape in the New Testament, especially defined by Jesus in the upper room. Remember the base camp stuff? Uh, agape is always active. It's always acting uh, without self-interest on behalf of others. It is always an action. It is never, ever just a feeling or even a self-feeling or a self-fullness. So what Paul is saying is the scriptures properly taught will produce, number one, a, a clean heart, cleansed from self, cleansed from the corruption of all the ideas that come in that are not of the Lord, cleansed from the dirt of this life, uh, much like the, uh, the apostles' feet were cleaned in the upper room by Jesus himself. Uh, they, their contact with, with the daily life around them needed constant cleansing. Their hearts were clean. Their consciences were clear. They weren't running from something. Uh, they always faced the sins that they had, knowing that they could repent and Jesus would forgive them. And any sin or anything that bothered them they could find uh, cleansing for that conscience. It would go away if they just brought it before the Lord. And then the third thing, uh, a genuine faith. We, went, we talked about the genuine faith that, that uh, Paul uh, really appreciated that Timothy had uh, with his mother and his grandmother teaching him. He trusted them. He began to listen to them. And so that gave Timothy the trust to believe Jesus. And that trust connected him with ancient faith, not just a response to miraculous faith, okay, which Timothy certainly saw in Lystra. He saw Paul make a command for a man to be made well in the name of Jesus. And the man who was crippled from birth uh, stood up and was made well. And, and so that was the miracle power of Jesus on display. But what Timothy connected with went way beyond that, way deeper. And we described that last week as a shallow type of faith. I talked about uh, John Ward's writing testimony and, and uh, kind of a millennial trying to follow all the prescriptions of the Jesus people movement and all the contemporary movements of faith and discovering they all had a shallow basis to them and that he couldn't get beyond the immediate transactional interactions with God and connect with a deeper faith, his frustrations and, and writing about that. But Timothy didn't have that problem because his mom and his grandma taught, taught him how to trust and connected him with an ancient faith. And then when he was, when he was uh, introduced to Jesus, that trust was natural. He trusted Jesus and his soul was saved and he was set on fire to serve Jesus the rest of his life. Okay, sorry for that review, but it's, but it's Paul's solution now coming into focus that he's got to see love rise and abound, that agape love as Jesus demanded in the latter part of the upper room teachings as essential to what he was going to be doing present in the community of faith and believers, okay? This is Paul's answer to the context of upheaval and confusion and devastation all around him. So let's talk a little bit about Nero, not a, my favorite topic to talk about. But folks, you got to understand something. This isn't just historical background. Both Paul and the earliest churches had to deal directly with Nero and Nero's empire. And this isn't just background, you know, this isn't just, well, society is going the wrong way. This is a man interacting, holding Paul's life in his hands, having been personally responsible for the death of Paul, Peter, 
most of the other apostles and many, many, perhaps thousands of other believers in Rome. And so the history that we know of of Nero is, is important. It's not just uh, background. It is true, immediate context. So you, mean, you need to understand that without question, the period from 63 to 68 was one of the most turbulent periods in Christian history. It was more turbulent than the later persecutions were. It was the most turbulent because the church was so in its infancy, it was so being brought into that era where the gospel of Jesus was being given out to the Gentiles and the nuances of that had to be experienced firsthand in the home churches around. So Nero himself uh, came to power in 54 AD and five years later in 59 AD, uh, Nero had his mother killed. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't say this for shock effect because there's gonna be much worse things that he did, but the historian Tacitus says that after this, that Nero plunged into all excesses. He had been suppressing uh, this, this wild behavior, but there were a few advisors and his mom which, which kept him from going into vices everywhere. That restrained him, and now it was gone and he indulged in all excesses and he lost all sense of right and wrong. Tacitus says that in 62 AD, after a few years of this unrestrained uh, excesses, that Nero began his reign of terror. And, and so uh, during this time, 62 AD, Nero began to profess a desire to rebuild most of Rome. He thought that Rome uh, was, was artistically behind the times. Uh, he thought that Greece had managed to carry elegance into the future, but Rome hadn't. Rome was kind of podunk to him. And so he, he tried to get uh, his uh, uh, Roman Senate to agree to a lot of legislation to rebuild, starting with Circus Maximus area, which he thought was the primary area to go out from to rebuild it in a more pleasing style. Uh, the Senate resisted him. Now keep in mind that, that during this time, uh, uh, Paul has been released. 62 AD, Paul's been released right when Nero kills his mom. Uh, and, and, so, um, and so Paul is now in Spain, but Nero is, is on this track to change the history of the empire. So on July 19, 64 AD, a fire begins in the Circus Maximus area, lasts for six days, then pauses a little bit like embers, and then restarts again and burns for three days later. Uh, only four of Rome's 14 districts did not get burned. And so most of Rome burned. Wood buildings, homes, shops, places of business, temples, foreign temples, contemporary temples, all burned to a mess, to a charred mess. Uh, and it was, um, it was the fact that uh, Nero wanted to reconstruct this area that later would bother the Roman Senate. But immediately after the fire, Nero blamed Christians for the fire and it became open season on Christians. So late in 64 AD and early 67, Christians were used as torches uh, in the circus. Uh, circus Maximus uh, was still usable and so they used it. And, uh, and, it, and by the way, I thought I already mentioned this, but Circus Maximus is where all the uh, games that uh, were pretend games with Christians as victims were, were conducted at. And, uh, and, and so um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17, we'll get to that after a while. Uh, it's literally true, probably, uh, that as a Roman citizen, Paul was not going to be put into those games to face the open mouth of the lion. He was spared from that because, the, because he was a Roman citizen, death by execution and beheading was the only legitimate sentence on him. He was a Christian, but he could not be thrown into Circus Maximus to be eaten by lions. 
And that's a shuddering thought to think about that it was literally happening uh, around him. We'll get to that when we get to 2 Timothy. Uh, so, um, uh, so in this period of 65 AD, early in the year, the upper class in Rome is very, very upset with Nero. They're not buying the uh, blame it on the Christians. They're horrified by the burning death of Christians everywhere in the city. Uh, they're reviling, they're revolting, and conspiracies began to break out everywhere that got a lot of traction. Uh, Roman senators, praetorian tribunes, centurions, prefects even, uh, began to insist that Nero be publicly accused of murdering his mother and his wife by this time, uh, and the burning of Rome, and get this, the practice of acting and his practice of chariot racing. They thought this should be made public and that Nero should be held accountable for this. And so uh, the upheaval that happened because of these conspiracies uh, just put Rome into a political turmoil. In 66 AD, the next year, Nero goes to Greece to participate in the Olympic Games. And he starts the, uh, uh, the Olympic Games in Corinth with a, with a dramatic reading. Uh, Nero was turning from politics, which he was failing miserably at, to acting. He wanted to be an actor, which was really, uh, really strange. And, and while he was in Corinth for those Olympic Games, he dispatched from Greece, he had dispatched uh, on, with Roman authority of the emperor, Vespasian with four legions of troops. A legion is about 6,000 Roman troops. Four leg legions to go and crush the Jewish revolt. It had started in 66 AD. Now the Romans were at war with the Jewish revolt. They were at war and, uh, you know, Vespasian rolls into Galilee, uh, goes all the way to Tiberias, retakes Tiberias, begins to go north. His son uh, Titus has been ordered to bring a, um, a, a legion from Alexandria and meet him there, and they're going to go take over Jerusalem. They're on their way, but it would take years to do that. And so, uh, but Nero put that into, uh, into motion. And then late in 66 AD, he returns to Rome from, the, from these games, but not as the, uh, an emperor, heroic, having gone somewhere, entering back into the city. He comes in dressed in an acting gown and, and comes back as a triumphant actor, having been awarded a medal for being an artist. He is literally doing cosplay in ancient Rome, and it disgusts the Roman Senate so much that they literally uh, are, are at their wits end. What do we do with this man? And that from that point, Nero turned from doing anything political, and he descended into a world of fantasy of the arts. Uh, conspiracies began to break out everywhere in Rome, plans to assassinate uh, Nero, and Nero became paranoid and thought the entire Senate was against him. So he left Rome in 66 AD and spent two years going to different places, practicing his uh, musical arts, his uh, acting dramatically arts, uh, and also his chariot racing. So that's why they were so upset with him. Instead of being emperor with all the tumult going around and pulling the empire back together, he was literally turning Rome into a chaotic mess, which it had become. So he stays away from Rome from 66 to 68 early. He comes back and he, he discovers that Galba and Otho have legions of troops that are ready to take Nero out. Uh, the Senate then declared Nero as a public enemy. He's still emperor, but he's a public enemy. And on June 9th, 68 AD, with soldiers coming to get him, he commits suicide with the help of a freedman. Immediately, Galba is, is appointed to be uh, emperor in his place. He is uh, brutally assassinated within six months. His follower, Otho, uh, is appointed emperor, is brutally assassinated in a, within six months. And a third one 
was brutally assassinated uh, in a few months' time until the Roman Senate sent for Vespasian and said, we need some stability. You come back here and you use the Roman military to, to restore order to our, to our land, to our city, to our world empire. And uh, Vespasian then became uh, the emperor for 10 years. And then uh, his son Titus took over after him. So that's, that's the history, that's the world uh, that Paul uh, was, was very much intertwined with, with the early be believers were very much intertwined with. And this is why the solution uh, that we have uh, put forward in, chap in verse 5 of chapter 3 is, is so critical. It's so enlightening. It's so illuminating. Uh, you know, if you ask the question, what would Paul do in today's time, you may be led by an understanding coming out of verse 5 of what he would do. So, um, Paul returns to Timothy. The church has gotten off track. He says, Timothy, you go into Ephesus and you insist that they don't uh, teach, um, and teach these other teachings. So they are myths and they are genealogies, but there's no simple characterization of them. In the world of the day, the myths included certainly uh, Old Testament Jewish myths, rab rabbinical myths, but very much so the myths of the world around them. We know that in particular, uh, um, Ephesus was plagued by Artemis myths, but we'll get to that in chapter 2. So apparently, people had been coming to faith in these house churches and began to, to want to be teachers, and they began to teach but they would teach things that were mixed and infused with the mythology around them. They didn't really know what to teach, and they were allowed to teach things that weren't according to the teaching that Paul thought was going on in the church. And so that's what Paul uh, tells Timothy to do. Don't allow the freedom anymore to teach. Uh, that, that, uh, and he specifically mentions God's house. Now, there is a reference in, in verse 4 to oikonomia, oikonomia. Literally, the two words mean home and laws. Uh, we encountered this phrase once before in Ephesians, and it was also in Colossians. But it literally means the house rules. And it literally applies here to the church home rules. There is a set of practices that must be followed. And we went through them at length in the prison epistles. They were the way in which we treat each other, the way in which we gather together in Christ's name and make sure that Jesus is, is lifted up on high, make sure that our own spirits are ready to have the risen Christ speak to us and live in our heart, and make sure that we're ready to love others, love all people, respect all people in our gatherings together. So what's happened apparently in the world in which Paul was in Spain is that the house rules were violated. And what Paul says literally in verse 4 uh, is they not only lead, the false teachings not only lead to meaningless speculations, but they break up the house rules so that the house churches can't function in the critical way that they're needed to function. Now, this is an elaborate understanding of this verse and the reference to oikonomia in verse 4, but I can tell you that in Titus and in Timothy, we will find later that whole house churches have been overturned and overrun by people coming in and teaching different things. There's no longer a place for anyone of authority to step in and say, the Apostle Paul has sent me to tell you to do these things maybe even read the book of, of Colossians and Ephesians and Philippians and, and read how the church is supposed to walk, uh, work. Lead how the believers in these home churches are supposed to grow in the faith and flourish in the faith. And so once the teachings overtook those, uh, then there was, it was no longer possible to correct it. Okay, so in verse 6 and 7, uh, Paul says, some have missed the whole point. They've turned away. Meaningless discussions. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they're talking about. 
early on in the Calvary Chapel movement, uh, I remember how much teaching was emphasized. I mean, we would have uh, nights of the week where we would go and, and we'd be taught. And the people teaching were just lay people uh, uh, taking the scriptures and teaching. And everyone was confident that the Holy Spirit could keep everyone on track. And I remember thinking, well, you know what? Uh, I'm called to teach something, but I really don't know what I'm talking about. And, and I think for the Calvary Chapel movement, it did great things. I mean, there's nothing like having to teach something which makes you learn it <laughs> very fast. And I found that out fast enough. But that doesn't, stop, uh, that doesn't stop people if they don't learn it and they teach anyway. It doesn't stop them from spreading stuff. So I'm not sure the best way to, to grow a small church is to put everybody into teaching mode. Uh, rather, uh, the most, most delicate thing of faith, genuine faith, has to be nurtured along by the type of teaching that's demanded in verse 5 of, these, of this passage. That we must have the goal of our instruction, love, and that through a clean heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. And that takes a lot of skill, practice, determination, experience. It takes a lot of uh, failures. It takes a lot of leading by the Lord to understand the delicate balance of that. But when you teach the Word of God properly, it will clean hearts and it will clear consciences and it will truly produce a genuine faith in everyone that hears it and they're going to start loving others with agape love. And that's the confidence that we need to have. And you don't just get that by being appointed uh, someone uh, who, who should teach you uh, what they're going to try to discover out of the scriptures. So I want to um, ask now, where are we today? And what's happening in the world around us that we might build that bridge, that hermeneutical bridge to take the right things out of this passage? Well, I probably don't need to tell you that conspiracy theories are everywhere. Um, we'll just mention QAnon and I'll let you go find the rest of them. Uh, the pseudo-modern world that we live in is chaotic. It's not just that truth is difficult to find. It's that it's pretty much absent and broken down anywhere it tries to emerge. Uh, anytime there's a truth claim, it's just basically destroyed by uh, by those who are the movers and shakers. And we live in a time where uh, the, the Christian church itself has uh, been, um, in a way, altered and merged with the culture to where we can no longer uh, help the culture uh, all that much. So, um, uh, let me, let me uh, just be, go through this carefully. I want to tell you that a book came out that was long awaited, a, um, a history, but not a religious history, uh, pretty much um, an objective history in the spirit of George Marsden and Mark Knoll. This book's been anticipated for years. Many of you have asked me to let you know when it came out, and, and uh, so I'm, doing, I'm taking this opportunity to let you know that The Rise and Fall of Dispensationalism, How the Evangelical Battle Over the End Times Shaped a Nation, is out. It's out now. It's a very difficult read. Uh, if you have trouble sleeping, read this one and you'll go right to sleep. Uh, I would imagine it could take years to go through this book in the footnote. It's by a man named De David G. Hummel, H-U-M-M-E-L. It was originally slated to be co-authored by Mark Knoll. Uh, he just writes the introduction, and I got from the introduction that perhaps Hummel had done such a good job documenting and progressing with everything that Knoll didn't feel like he wanted to put his name on it and, make, and take credit also. So it's just a monograph uh, uh, authored by Hummel right now. But there's one part of this I want to point out because it's important for our context today. Hummel points out that in the 19th century that the church had an institutional complex that was erected as an infrastructure for how the contemporary church proceeded. There were Bible institutes, uh, revival circuits, missions organizations, and religious publishers. 
And what those people thought and felt moved the church, led the church into areas that they thought it should go, led them to interact with culture around them and the ways that they thought they should interact, and, uh, and also um, uh, pretty much called the shots. But Hummel points out that later in the 20th century, uh, there was a new uh, focus of order that took decades to, to put into place, but, uh, but nevertheless became the new order. And it was built on televangelists, megachurches, political advocacy, and cultural institutions like print and electronic media and music media. So a new focus of leading the church. Now the others still, still were active. You know, the, the old complex was still active. Bible institutes, seminaries enrolling students, prophecy conferences uh, all over the place. But the focus of authority had shifted uh, and the new change that was decades in the making was now here. The result of it is rather than steering the culture to Christianity, the culture began to absorb the imagination of the apocalypse. It began to uh, understand and absorb the fact that there was going to be an end of time. And so now the end of time is held up by, uh, by people, secular and religious people, as the thing that we need to focus on and understand. Um, I don't want to give you too many examples of this, but uh, you know that Elon Musk and, and Joe Rogan have become what's called apocalyptic centrists. Uh, they have good news for everybody that the end is near, but it's near because there's a woke mind virus that is going to finally eliminate mankind. Uh, Kathy and I were, were both uh, doing things outside on Friday, and there was a newspaper in our driveway, the Epic Times. Looked a lot like the register print, <laughs> looked authentic, uh, kind of smaller than the register, but not much smaller. And I began to look, I began to read it first, and I noticed a very strange tilt to every single article. I mean, articles about Dr. Fauci and COVID and the connection between his being the origin of, of COVID and uh, just weird stuff that just we thought we had, had worked through, you know, um, and, and many things like that. Okay, it turns out that this magazine or this newspaper actually, was, uh, was actually um, produced by a Chinese new, uh, new religious group, which, uh, which is uh, having to do with, with Falun Hoon, I think it is. And, uh, and, and so um, the, the idea here uh, is a Falun Gong. I'm sorry, I forgot the name of that, but new religious movement and that the believers are anticipating Judgment Day in which Chinese communists will be sent to hell and all, of their al all the allies with this group will be spared. That's what they are pushing for, the end times apocalypse, which will do away with the Chinese government, Chinese communist government. Okay, So that's the religious version of the conspiracy. The secular version of the conspiracies have no religious element to them. They merely have a devoted followers who will follow these people all the way to an apocalypse that, that they think is coming that has no involvement at all with any religious element, but it's just the end of mankind and, and mankind's end. So we're living in these, these times like this. And I can tell you one thing is universal through all of these is that violence is brewing. Violence like happened after Nero was uh, finally uh, eliminated through his own hand, through his own suicide. Violence is going to be the solution which moves toward an apocalypse, which they all have a different definition of, which the church helped bring into uh, the American culture by its emphasis on uh, that being a motivating factor. But, you know, I think that uh, this is the point to point out, this is the part to point out, that Paul will teach that violence is not the fate of Christians. We are to be peaceful people. We are to be peaceful people all the way through 
whatever apocalypse and crises are coming. We are supposed to be called to peace. Uh, that pathway is a steady commitment to what verse 5 reveals. We just keep committed to becoming loving people, knowing that if we are, we're growing. Knowing that if we can study and teach the teachings of Jesus, our hearts will be continually cleaned, our consciences will be cleared, and our genuine faith will be established, and we can truly, truly trust that we are growing in the grace of the Lord, who is the Lord of all. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, thank you for saving us by grace. Thank you for giving us a glint of light on how to live in times which can be eerily similar to the times of the greatest turmoil in early Christian history. And I pray that we could all realize that we are going to be learning and teaching about Jesus until he returns. And that return, while it'll involve apocalypse, the apocalypse isn't the major part of that. It is the kingdom that he's going to bring into this world. And that kingdom will be peaceable. It will be led by the Lord of peace, the Prince of peace, and it will be peace evermore. So help us live in these turbulent and reactive times with peace in our heart. Use these letters to generate peace in our heart. Help us to steer clear of teachings that will get us off track, that will call us away from your plan and purpose. And keep us on track, loving and peaceable all the way in Jesus' name. And now I pray that this week you would have a peaceful week, that you will find yourself drawn to Jesus in all of the troubles that you have, in all of the places where it's difficult to go on, that you'll find Jesus, the living, loving Lord, who is always there for us and will be there with us right through this life and on into the next. Those who believe in him, though they die, uh, they will live. In Christ's name, amen.